So hi, good morning everyone and uh, good evening to people in India and uh, anywhere else. So today we have Dr. Sumit Gujral, so who is Professor of Pathology at uh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. So he's going to give a talk on flow cytometry and echocardiogram. So thank you, Dr. Gujral, for sparing your time for us. So it's all yours now, Dr. Gujral. Thanks, Rivat. Good morning, uh, my friends in the United States and my colleagues and friends in India. Good evening. Uh, I'm a pathologist with interest in leukemias, lymphomas, and uh, we have a lab here, small lab in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, where we focus on hematolymphoid neoplasms. Work in a, a cancer hospital, which is uh, 75 years old. We just had our platinum jubilee. So thanks for giving me this opportunity to interact with you. I feel bad that I can't see you. Maybe you guys also cannot see me, but still, let's see. Let's hope we enjoy this next 40 minutes. Uh, so my talk is on um, uh, acute leukemias and flow cytometry. So I just begin with, uh, shared with you the 2008 classification, which was published you know, many years back. We already having now 2016 classification. Now this older classification and the new classification are more or less very similar. Some new genetic markers have come. Uh, if you look at this, the common leukemia, the precursor lymphoids are B and the T type. And uh, they are mostly based, sub further subdivided on, based, on, based on genetic abnormalities. Now go to myeloid neoplasms, broadly six subtypes. If you look at the MDS, MDS is divided into further many, many subtypes. And if you look at the AMLs, in 2008, they were divided into six subtypes. The commonest being the AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities. Now in 2016, which has still not come, it's just come as a manuscript in blood. They have new criteria for many, many diseases, starting from CML to CMML, different, slightly changed definitions of these diseases, published in blood. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. I, I straight go to uh, the talk of leukemias and the diagnosis of acute leukemias. Uh, the diagnosis starts with, in the, lab, in the laboratory, starts with morphology, Romanovsky stain. We do a GIMSA, a right stain here, GIMSA and right stain, and morphology and, uh, and cytochemistry. So this is basically done on perfus smear and the bone marrow, bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow touch imprints. If you have a case of acute leukemia and you have blast, some blasts are very classical, which we you know, easily diagnose based on these R rods and we know that this is a myeloblast. This has to be either myelodysplastic syndrome or acute myeloid leukemia. There are R rods, so very classical. But some blasts are not very classical, so they don't show you R rods like this one. This is a large size cell compared with the rich cells of the RBCs. It's a large size cell with the burden cytoplasm, very free flowing grayish blue cytoplasm, prominent pencil carved nuclei, nuclei. You see the nuclei, very prominent. Some granules in the cytoplasm. This morphology reminds you, you know, of a monoblast, but you can't call it monoblast till you do some stains or you do further workup. So here we use two common cytochemistry stains in the laboratory. One is myeloproxidase or Sudan black. And the second one is non-specific yeast trace. So the non-specific yeast trace is very classically strongly positive in monoblasts. And the monoblast might be negative for myeloproxidase and Sudan, Sudan black. So these are the two most important stains in any hematology lab, myeloproxidase and non-specific yeast trace, which any lab can afford to have. Not very expensive. So if you have a Romanowski stain and these two stains, at least you, you have a beginning for acute leukemias. And then there are many blasts which look like, which are mimics, but they might not be blastics. Like I'll show you a picture of nine cases, different cases. One maybe a, on the top left could be a Burkitt's, then in the top center could be a SLL, CLL, PLL. On the top right, it is mantis cell blastic. Then down is hematogones, gamma delta T cell lymphomas, granular ALL, DL, BCL. So if you look at this and hematogones, there are different types of cases here and it's difficult to subtype these cases. They look bad, they look, few of them look blastic, few of them look high grade. So here we, uh, morphology and the cytochemistry alone won't help. 
and we we can label them as hematolymphoid neoplasm to be on the safer side if you do not understand whether they are blastic or mature it's safer to call them hematolymphoid neoplasm and ask for further workup now the further workup basically means the ancillary techniques which we have now there are three major ancillary techniques which we have one is the the gold standard now for diagnosing of acute leukemias is immunophenotyping which is done basically by two methods immunosochemistry on the solid tissues and flow cytometry immunophenotyping on liquids second is uh, if you look at this slide on the right side this is the immunosochemistry slide stands for bcl2 which shows um hne section which you know this is a paraffin block section which has been stained with immuno stains bcl2 and the brown all the brown cells are positive for bcl2 and the blue looking cells are negative so the brown ones are mostly in the t zone mantle zone and marginal zone and some some cells within the germinal center these all these big balls are the secondary follicles there are very few brown dots they are possibly cd4 positive t cells which are positive for bcl2 so these are normal bcl2 in a normal lymph node on the left side if you see this is a raw colors this is basically you get in flow cytometry where you study the cells or the events we call as events so each dot is an event or could be a cell and you know these two techniques are complementary the advantage of immunohistochemistry is that you you have a slide you can see microscopy you can do microscopy you have morphology architecture cellular details that's a major advantage of microscopy you know which you can select cells of interest based on morphology however the flow cytometry has a major advantage that it gives you multicolor when i say multicolor it means that on one cell at one time we can study six markers six antibodies or eight antibodies maybe 10 12 14 15 antibodies at one time so this is the beauty of flow cytometry in immunohistochemistry we need a slide for a for an antibody for second antibody we need another slide few laboratories do two color ihcs but generally one color single color ihc is more popular the second common ancillary technique is cytogenetics which is again uh, extremely important very very important for risk risk stratification we do conventional karyotyping where you study 23 chromosomes or you do fish for the common markers like we have 922 in amls we have 821 translocation 1517 in version 16 common markers then we have third technique is molecular diagnostics now at the genetic level now just to give an example this is the flit3 mutation case in a case of aml now this flit3 mutation is a bad sign so now all these techniques give you help you in diagnosing in prognosticating and giving you predictive predictive markers so just to conclude these ncd techniques help ncd techniques help you help you reach a diagnosis help you find good leukemias versus bad leukemias and also help you in giving predictive markers like cd20 is a good predictive marker for lymphomas we can give rituximab and next very important treatment effectiveness these techniques can help you follow up the patients for minimal residual disease after treating these patients on chemotherapy Now I start with some cases, and we'll uh, we'll discuss uh, the roles of these ancillary techniques and the morphology and cytochemistry in cases of acute leukemia. I have around five cases, so we start with the case one. I'll be happy if you want to interrupt in between. So if you have any questions, otherwise you can take the questions at the end whenever. I'll be happy to if you interrupt me in between. First case is a 45-year-old female came to us with fever weakness for one month duration. on examination she has pancytopenia and peripheral smear was done revealed 75 78% blast this is a slide which i have shown you earlier classical myeloblast or rod seen so if you do myeloperoxidase in this case it will be positive cytochemical myeloperoxidase it was positive we can see this brown kind of crystal strong positivity myeloperoxidase so this is classical myeloblast now based on morphology and cytochemistry we have we can call it this is acute myeloleukemia now what do you do next shall we stop here or we go ahead now in india what we do is uh, if the patient is poor many patients who cannot afford the treatment we we stop here 
and then the clinician decides whether he needs more tests or their funds available because many patients cannot take treatment protocol based treatment when i say treatment it is basically means protocol based treatment like the defined treatment for aml so if patient can afford the treatment then we go further so what do we do the next test will be as as i said the ncd techniques the first ncd technique would be flow cytometry now in this case do we need to do flow cytometry we already have a diagnosis of aml why do you want to waste maybe Two hundred dollars. I do not know how much is the cost in the United States, but in, in India, in the Indian currency, it costs you fifteen thousand Indian rupees. So why do you want to waste so much money by doing flow cytometry when you already have a diagnosis? There is a definite role of flow cytometry here. One, it helps you in subtyping. More important, it helps you at the later stage in MRD detection because you need to have upfront markers in this case of leukemia. It always helps to have a diagnosis at upfront so we did the flow in this case and we did different tubes b cell tube and the t cell and the myeloid tube and we saw that case the blast expressed all the myeloid markers and tmpo cd13 cd33 117 in addition it expressed cd19 which is a b cell marker and hldr and cd56 now cd19 is maybe expressed in few amls these AMLs generally have a T821 and uh, they have tall, slender, thin or rods. So now diagnosis number three based on morphology, cytochemistry and flow is AML with CD90 and 56 expression. Now what next? Now next we do cytogenetics, so conventional and fish. So in this case we did 821, 1517, inversion 16. They were negative. So the fish and the conventional cytogenetics in this patient were showing normal patterns. So our fourth diagnosis means based on morphology, cytochemistry, flow, and cytogenetics remains as AML with CD19 and 56 expression and normal cytogenetics. Now what do you do next? Now we do the molecular, the third technique. The co common markers are FLIT3 and NPM mutations and the uh, SEPA. And in this case, same case which I shown you earlier, we have a mutant FLIT3. So the final diagnosis here is AML with CD19 and 56 expression and normal cytogenetics with FRIT3 mutations. Now, AML with FRIT3 mutations have a very poor prognosis. The survival is bad. The NP mutations, on the other hand, have a better prognosis. So there comes the role of all these markers to help do risk stratification. Now, what is flow cytometer? Now, basically, you know, uh, briefly about uh, next few slides on what is flow cytometer and what is what are its applications. And I talk about few dot plots for the beginners, for the young MD pathology students. Uh, I'll just touch upon basics of flow cytometry. As the name says, flow cytometry it basically means anything which flows. So the measurement of cellular properties as they flow. It basically is an instrument which works like, like all our cell counter, hematology cell counter, which we do in hematology lab to do CBCs, complete blood counts. They are based mostly on the similar principle. The difference here is this is an immunoflow cytometer. Here, in addition, we, we can do antibodies. Uh, just to show you a picture, a cartoon taken from Maker, Nature Reviews, how is the process? It starts with sample preparation when you take the peripheral blood of the patient. Second would be the, third would be the data acquisition, you run the sample, and fourth you have the data with you and do the analysis. So I would recommend that this is a good article to go through. What are the applications of flow? These are the common applications. We monitor the HIV patients. We do the leukemia lymphoma immunophenotyping and many. The first and two, number two are the commonest applications. The leukemia immunophenotyping is, is a topic for today. Now, just to share with you some common plots of flow cytometry immunophenotyping. Now, first will be forward scatter versus side scatter. This is without adding any antibodies. So, if you look at the forward scatter, which tells you the size of the, cell, the side scatter, which tells you the internal complexity or the granularity of the cells. If you look at this, there are three populations on the forward scatter this is a lymphocyte which has a low forward scatter low side scatter then we have monocytes in between and a big population of neutrophils 
which have both strong forward as well as high side scatter. On the right side, there's another plot which shows red dots and it shows you most of the cells, most of the events are in the lymphocyte area. Monocytes are very few and neutrophils are also very few. This looks abnormal. Maybe this is some kind of lymphocytosis or acute leukemia that we have to find out. But this is abnormal. Now second, how do you differentiate whether there are lymphocytes here or there are blasts here or they are mixed? So we can take help of an antibody called the CD45, leukocyte common antigen. It's a very important marker in flow. CD45 gating we call it, which is a cornerstone in any case of acute leukemia. Our analysis starts from CD45 and ends with CD45. Now if you look at CD45 on the y-axis and side scatter on the x-axis, you see many populations, five, six dense areas. So this is CD45 strong where I put a small circle cartoon here. CD40 of strong cells, these are, which have no side scatter, these are lymphocytes. Now this second population is monocytes, which has some granules. These are the myeloid cells. The top one is the mature neutrophils and the low ones are the immature myeloid precursors. And this area is the area for progenitors. When I say progenitors, it basically includes all your stem cells, blasts, hematogones. They come here, cancer cells. Normal cancers, normal myeloblasts, cancer myeloblasts, hematogones, they all come here in the red window gate, blast gate. You can call it blast gate or this is better termed as progenitor area. And below the progenitor could be debris where you can have some RBCs, red cells, yeah, platelets. Now second point for postgraduates, for residents is that, you know, X axis versus Y axis. There could be companies which use CD45 on y-axis and they teach you like that and then other companies might show you CD45 on x-axis. It basically gives you the same message. There's nothing different here. It's the same. Now, I'll just show you an example of two cases. On the left side, it's a CD45 side scatter. On the right side, also a CD45 side scatter. If you look at the right side, the progenitor gate has huge population of red dots. These red colors which we have given, the red colors we have given, you see the CD45 progenitor gate, it tells you it is 73% blast. So almost 73% blast in this progenitor area. And here there are very few blasts. This is a normal looking marrow and this is very abnormal looking marrow. So this CD45 single antibody tells you that possibly we're dealing with acute leukemia. There are few lymphocytes, few monocytes and few myeloid cells. Now, another role of flow is maturation patterns. That's an extremely important role. I'll just discuss with you in the next slide how maturation patterns in a normal myeloid series. Now, if you look at this plot, 45 and side scatter, these are the red dots are the monocytes, the green ones are the mature neutrophils, the blue ones are the immature myeloid precursors. You use two antibodies, don't have to see all the plots, just look at CD13 and 16. As I told you in the previous slide here, here you can see the green ones are the mature neutrophils and the blue ones are the immature myeloid precursors. So these blue are the possibly some myeloblasts as they mature to promyelocytes, they lose 16 and they become myelocytes, they lose 13 and they become neutrophils where they are strongly positive for both 13 and 16. Now this is a maturation pattern of the myeloid series cells from blasts to myelocytes to neutrophils. Now this is a pattern which is extremely important for us to understand flow cytometry immunophenotyping, especially in cases of myelodysplastic syndrome where these patterns get disturbed because you have less granules, you have more lobes, so the patterns of these maturations get disturbed and very those cases of myelodysplasia which cannot be picked up on morphology can be picked up by flow since flow is going to analyze can easily analyze more than a million cells. Now the next is just to share with you maturation patterns in a normal B cell. Now there's something called as hematogones. I'm sure most of you know about this. The hematogones are uh, mature B cells which are in the marrow. The morphology can may resemble blasts. Few of them resemble like blasts. And if you do CD34, TDT, 10, they are all positive for they might express CD34, TDT, and even CD10. 
They are scanned cytoplasm, generally do not have a nuclei. Now, if you look at these few pictures, they're all hematogones. The large cells here, these are hematogones. This is a normal marrow in a child. There's small lymphocytes and the hematogones, early hemat stage one hematogones. Hematogones. They look like blasts here. So there are two cases here. On the left is a case of hematogone, normal marrow, which came to us for thrombocytopenia. And second case is acute leukemia. And this is a blast. So these can be tricky situations where, especially in infants, uh, kids who are three months or four months old who came to you with fever for maybe fe two weeks or three weeks, or maybe with some swelling, which could be a round cell tumor, and you do a bone marrow, you might find 60 to 70% lymphoid cells, and they have maybe 15, 20, or 30% blast-like cells, which are possibly hematogones. And many of us have called them as acute leukemia, and we have burnt our fingers many times. So one has to be very careful in analyzing pediatric bone marrow, especially if the infants. They're because they are more in the infant bone marrows and also increased in post-transplant and post-chemotherapy, post-viral infections, and even in round cell tumors, they can be increased. Uh, now, just to share with you next picture, I'll show you. This is a look at the CD45 on x-axis and sites scattered on the y-axis. This is normal peripheral bone marrow. You see these are the normal neutrophils, myelocytes, and this is a lymphocyte here. This, there are three populations of lymphocytes. Strong CD45, moderate CD45, and a weak CD45, or maybe we are very weak. And this is a debris, possibly debris. So let's study these three populations. One, two, and three. Yeah, once again, let's give color to these populations. Like this blue is stage three hematogones, which are like mature B cells. This green color to stage two hematogones and red one to stage stage one is this, this is stage two. Stage one is the stage of hematogones, which looks like blasts. They could be 34 positive, 10 positive, they would be 20 negative, and maybe TDT positive. So these are the areas, these are the cells which are important for us to understand. Actually, even P2, even this stage two and stage one both, which may resemble like blasts on morphology and even on immunophenotyping. If you do not do a panel of markers, you might call it blast. And they are important in cases of B cell ALL, which are which have come to you for MRD studies. MRD is minimal residual disease detection studies. Now, if you do CD19 and CD45, again you can separate hematogones. These are the templates which we make. These are the templates which we make based on normal healthy individuals. So what we do is we take 10, 15, or 20 healthy individuals which have come to the, uh, my hospital for something else, maybe for lymphomas or for some round cell tumors, and we make their bone marrows and and we do this pat, make these templates based on normal healthy individuals. So we know that our CD19 and 45 hematogones will come within these templates. Anything which goes out of B cells it will be abnormal. So these all are B cells. I have taken CD19 positive B cells and I've done 45 here and see the stage one hematogone, which are red dots here, stage two and stage three. These are possibly the more mature B cells, which will be 20 positive, and they'll be negative at 10, 34. If you look at these red dots, they would be 20 negative, and they are CD45 weak. They might express 34 and 10 very strong. Stage one, hematogone, stage two hematogones, and stage three hematogones. Now, why do you study hematogones, as I mentioned? Very important. A minimal residual disease in B-cell ALL resembles hematogones on morphology. So many times, post-induction marrows, when we get day 30, day 28 bone marrows in B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we have 10%, 8%, 12% blast-like cells, which we think are blast. So with what we do in our reporting, we write 10% blast slash hematogones, and then we need to confirm by flow cytometry. So to give an example again, 10 on the x-axis, 20 on the y-axis. Now this kind of classical waterfall pattern is very classical of hematogones. So these are mature B cells, 20 strong positive, 10 negative. Stage three, stage one are here, which are like blast, which are 20 negative, 10 strong positive. And these all are 19 positive B cells. So I've taken only 19 positive B cells 
and these are stage 3, stage 2, and stage 1 hematogon. These could be plasma cells. Yeah. Now, if I show you two cases, this is a normal bone marrow hematogon pattern. If you look at this case of acute leukemia, here all the cells are here, 10 positive. Nothing 20. So these are 10 positive, 19 positive. These are 19 positive. Some are 20. Many of them are dual, 20 and 10, and very few are 10 strong. So this is a normal pattern of hematogons. This is very abnormal. Here, all the 19 positive B cells are 10 positive. So this possibly is a leukemia. Now we make templates, as I mentioned, for MRD detection. And what is templates? I'll just share with you. Here, like this kind of templates we make, as I mentioned previously, we take some healthy individuals, 15, 20 healthy individuals, and we understand all cells, B cells and T cells and myeloid cells, and look at their patterns. And then we make these templates, and we know that all the cells with, between 20 and 10, which are B cells, B cells will be lying in this pattern and within this template. If they are going out, let's say this, if these cells are going out, it's abnormal. Now, this is a case of frank acute leukemia, which we just discussed. And the third case I'm showing you will be post-chemotherapy, like post-induction. Now, this is the third slide, the same case, which gave us given chemotherapy. And you see a lot of dots, a lot of events coming out of this template. So this is your MRD. This is possibly mature B cells, hematogons. This is surely MRD. Maybe this is also MRD, but this is surely your MRD. So you can't call it MRD based on one or two markers. You need to do a big panel markers, so at least three LAIPs to be done, leukemia-associated immunophenotype, or away from normal, or LAIPs. We'll discuss, discuss about these entities. So that was maturation pattern in normals. Now I go to maturation pattern in disease. Now very simply to talk about myelodysplastic syndrome. Now this is a case of elderly male, 56, 61 male, who came to us with pancytopenia, has blasts and some monocytoid cells and dyspoietic cells, pseudo pelzer hue. Now, if you do a flow in such cases, this is a normal on the left side. This is the MDS on the right side to compare. You see the granularity has come down. And if you do CD45, here also, this is normal, this side, and this is the, our patient of MDS. Your granules are less, so the myeloid series are almost kissing the y axis. Here you see the nice granule cells, myeloid cells. Here the myeloid cells have all shifted to this side. This again basically tells you these are hypogranular myeloid cells. And if you do markers, if you do antibodies, I'll just mention about this 13 and 16 plot, which is very classical as a, like a Nike pattern, like a yes sign of 13 and 16 of neutrophils. It is lost here. It's almost become a flat. So this again, it tells you these are abnormal dyspoietic myeloid CD cells. Possibly you're dealing with these kind of cells in the bone marrow. Now, if you look at the myeloid maturation, let's talk about neutrophils, granulocytic maturation. Now, this is antigen expression in normal granulocytic maturation. Let's, this is a blast and it gets into promyelocytes, myelocytes, band, metamyelocytes, and neutrophil. I'll mention especially three or four markers here. CD45, as we all know, is a marker for mature cells. It is negative in blast or weak in blast, but picks up in mature cells. It is strongest in it's very strong in lymphocytes. So neutrophil is strong and the blast, it is negative or weak. Similarly, CD34 positive only in blast, gets negative by promyelocyte, before promyelocytes. The third important marker is CKIT, CD117, which is expressed by blast and goes still promyelocyte, but dips at promyelocytes. Now the fourth marker is interesting, CD13, as a myeloid marker. It is expressed by blast and promyelocytes. It dips at myelocyte because it gets almost negative. And again, picks up at metamyelocytes and becomes strong in neutrophils. Now, this is very interesting. So this is very important to understand each marker, how it behaves with the whole lineage of B or T or myeloid cells before we embark on the journey of diagnosing the leukemias, lymphomas, dyspoietic cells. I skipped the other markers, but we can do all list of markers, 11C, 16. These are important markers to study myelodysplastic syndrome and leukemias. I go to case number two. If there is any question here, we can I can stop or I go to case number two. Okay, I go to case number two. Uh, this is a five-year-old boy who came to us with fever for one month. 
And I'm showing this case. This is almost a 13, 14 year old case with us, early 2000s or late 1999 or 2001. That time we used to do three colors, flow cytometry. So this boy came to us. I'm just showing you this for historical reasons. We do not do three colors now. And nobody in the United States also do not do any three colors, but still uh, very interesting to share with the young postgraduates. So smear reveals acute leukemia. We did two stains, myeloperoxidase was negative, no R rod. So this is a diagnosis, provisional diagnosis is MPO negative acute leukemia. So we need to do flow for the lineage. So that time we did very few markers. You see two B cell markers, two T cell markers, three myeloid. Now these are the Indian guidelines which are published in 2008, which we do not use anymore. And we do not recommend anybody to use these guidelines because they are very old now. But those were the days when many laboratories used to cut corners, used to do very few markers, three markers or two markers to come to a diagnosis. So we came up with Indian guidelines, which was a consensus meeting, almost 45 hematopathologists from India met and uh, came to conclude that these are the markers, minimal markers for acute leukemia, similarly minimal markers for lymphomas, CLPDs. So in this case, we did these markers and I'm not showing you the, showing you the pictures. But these three markers are positive, HLA-DR, CD10, and CD19. So based on these three markers, we called it, and based on the morphology, we call it B-cell ALL. Though these three markers are also seen in normal B-cells. But hold behold, also in Burkitt's lymphoma, these markers will be positive. Now, do you have to differentiate B-cell ALL from Burkitt's? Now, the, traditionally, Burkitt's have a very classical morphology, but not all of them might show you vacuoles, like like in textbook pictures. So one has to be careful. So you have to look at the expression of 45, TDT 34. And also, in case you have a doubt, you can do light chain restriction, which is classically seen in Burkitt. You, if you have markers, more markers, 38, 81, MIB1, and you have tissues, you can do CMIC, or you can do SAR genetics. So these lymphomas, both, this is a mature B-cell lymphoma, and this is blastic. They, they all will have these C markers. Even follicular lymphoma and diffuse are D cell lymphomas, which are slightly low grade. Follicular lymphomas, grade one and two, are low grade. TLBCL is, could be low grade and high grade equal. They also express these markers. And also, as I mentioned, hematogons. So, based on three, four markers, we cannot come to a diagnosis. So, using less markers can be very uh, dangerous. So, one has to be careful when you are doing your um, any testing. And moreover, diagnosis is not based on flow alone, it's based on a lot of things together, starts is a multidisciplinary a diagnosis based on morphology, clinical history, panels, patterns, cytogenetics, and molecular. So we need to do a comprehensive diagnostic panels. Now, uh, in the last five, six years, we've moved, moved on to now six colors. Now we do 10 colors and 13 colors. So I'll, show, I'll be showing you the next few cases based on, there'll be at least eight to 10 colors. So now if you look at this slide, just, just for interest's sake, I'm showing you. One of my colleagues, Prashant, is very keen. He's our, uh, he's our rock star in flow, flow lab. He trained in our lab. He even worked with Mary Ellis in NIH for four years. He's back with us. Now he does uh, keeps on trying new markers, antibodies all the time. Now if you look at this CD19 and T cell receptor gamma delta, these two antibodies are fixed to one fluorochrome V421. So these are two mutually exclusive antibodies that stuck to one fluorochrome. Similarly here, three is for T cells, 14 is for monocytes. They're again mutually exclusive. The tag to V500. So you can use two markers with one fluorochrome. So here you, you can separate four or five cells. Gamma delta T cells, alpha beta T cells and monocytes are here. B cells will be here. So this is the beauty of multicolors. More lasers, more colors, more complications, more troubleshoots. So multicolor flow is the fashion. And uh, you have more lasers, you have more colors. But one has to be careful about the troubleshoots and the issues related to high sensitive instruments. So now, this is just a list of markers used commonly in acute leukemia these days with us. This is actually not the complete list. We still have more markers in the T cell tube. And then we have B cell tube. We have two myeloid tubes, one myeloid, one monocytic, and one cytoplasmic tube. So traditionally, we do five tubes. 10 to 12 colors in our lab for acute leukemia. I'll show you case three. The young girl came to us with fever for two weeks. 
white cell count was 56,000. That was smear showed blast. Cytochemistry was done, negative for both myeloperoxidase, non-specific histories. So it was given as a MPO negative, acute leukemia. For lineage, flow was done. We did all the five tubes. And as we go, you see this, this is CD45 here and side scatter here. We take the singlets and this, these are the lymphocytes, which are 45 strong. And this is the progenitor area. All the red dots you see here, 76%, they're all blasts. Very few neutrophils, very few monocytes. So these are blasts. So we know this is acute leukemia. Now we need to further subtype whether they're T cells, B cells, myeloid, or they are something else. Now in the B tube, we see that these are 10 and 19 positive. The T tube markers were negative. Myeloid tube markers were negative. HLADR was positive. So the diagnosis was pre-BALL, positive for 34, 19, 10, 20 was weak, and HLADR was positive. So the diagnosis was the common ALL in children, precursor B cell, lymphoblastic leukemia. Now, after the diagnosis, we did the proidy here, DNA proidy. This is a prognostic marker. Now look at this. We do now ploidy and immunophenotyping in the same tube. If you look at this plot here, these red dots are your blast, CD45 here, and the blue dots are lymphocytes. And you look at this DNA ploidy, this cycle here, and this is a tumor cycle here. So if we overlay these pictures, we know that the red are the blast. So this is a hyperdiploidy. Our DNA index is 1.21. So this is a hyperdiploidy ALL, which is a good prognostic marker. But when we did the cytogenetics, it was Philadelphia chromosome positive, which is a strong leukemia, bad leukemia. Tell AML1 was negative. So our final diagnosis in this case was the child has precursor B cell ALL with hyperdiploidy, hyperploidy, Philadelphia positive. Now this was given treatment, chemotherapy, and we called the patient after a month to look for response. So day 30, bone marrow was done. And bone marrow revealed good erythroid response, myeloid cells, and occasional cells like these two cells, which look like you know hematogones or blasts, we do not know. Some lymphocytes, but two cells here, slightly largest, they look slightly abnormal. So what we do, now we do only one tube. We did the MRD tube, we have one tube. Now we don't have to do all the five tubes, like we did up front, B, T, two myeloids and cytoplasmic. Now we do only one tube. Eight markers or ten markers, whatever you do, these are like this. It has a lot of markers which are important for MRD detection B cell ALL. So, here you see there are very few 19 positive B cells, very, very few, only 0.5 percent. Now, we have to focus on these cells 0.5 percent cells in the bone marrow. So, we take a million cells, means 10 lakh events, and study if you have any abnormal cells and any number more than 0 0.01 percent. Is significant in B cell ALLs 0.01% or more MRD is clinically significant. So here if you look at CD10 and 45, this is a nice normal pattern, but there are some dots which are very strong for CD10, given red color here. Now this is MRD. This is very, very strong for CD10, highly abnormal. Now if you look at these are the templates of 10 and 20, 10 is going out. This population is going out of the templates. So this is abnormal for us. And based on one, we cannot call it MRD, so we did other markers. 45 is weak, 10 is strong, 20 is negative, 34 is strong, 38 is lost. So based on all these markers, 123 is here, very weak. 66 is also positive. So based on all these markers, we confidently, we can say this is MRD positive. But the, on the calculation based on all the cells and the, the small 20, 30 dots which we saw here, here, I think these are better. We, we do a calculation, and in this case, it was 0.02% of abnormal B blast. So this is kind of significant because more than 0.01%. So we have to tell the clinician, medical oncologist, pediatric oncologist, whether they have to intensify or go with the same treatment. Generally, when MRD is negative, they de-intensify. When MRD is positive, they continue with the same treatment, and maybe they repeat MRD later. Now, what is MRD? Just a couple of slides on that. It's a low-level disease, which is you now detected by the techniques other than microscopy. And the two common techniques are flow and PCR. PCR is basically molecular technique used for diagnosing MRD in CML and APML because these are diagnosed based on molecular. And in B-cell LL, T-cell LL, and most of the AML, 
flow is the standard gold standard to do MRD. Now BLL is is mandatory to do MRDs in BLLs. Not many centers do MRD in AML. So now MRD detection is a new definition of complete response, in, especially in B cell AL, which is the commonest leukemia in children. And it predicts laps and also it defines post emission therapy, avoiding over treatment or under treatment. So basically, MRDs are leftovers. As you say, as I mentioned, the PCR and flow are the most important modalities to detect MRD. However, the other one important ones are equally important are clinical. If the patient walks into the OPD and the medical oncologist can, you know, just by talking and looking at the patient will judge, can guess at least. Looks like in clinical remission. Then you do CBC, you do a microscopy, you do cytogenetics. So all are equally, all are important. In flow cytometry, two most important principles where MRD detection is based is leukemia associated immune phenotypes and away from normal. This is very important in myeloid leukemias. I'll show you an example later. So there are two principles which we use for MRD detection, leukemia associated immune phenotypes, which are absent in normal bone marrow cells and away from normal means away from the template which we have drawn, the patterns are out of the templates. Now go to case four. Now this is a young girl came to us with fever one month, has a big spleen and liver by cytopenia. Paraphos smear shows blast, bone marrow revealed 28% blast. MPO was negative. We call it acute leukemia. We did MPO and it was negative. MPO was negative. Doesn't look like monoblastic though, but MPO was negative. So we call it MPO negative acute leukemia. We did flow for lineage. Here again, you see we have our singlets. We are do a viability gate, then laser gate time gate. Then we have the CD45 side scatter. CD45 on the y axis. These are strong, positive. Most of the cells are very strong. Few cells are weak. So if you look at the peripheral blood and bone marrow at 28% cells, and they are very strong here. Most of them are very strong. The red dots. So let's study what are the red events and what are the blue events. Are these cells of interest or these are the cells of interest? Because this is the area of lymphocytes and monocytes. And this is the area of lymphocytes or maybe progenitors. Actually, this is the main area for progenitors. Now, if you look at the B tube, and if you believe me, the red dots are the cells of interest. They are negative for everything. There are very few B cells. All the red dots are negative. Most of the cells are negative for B cells. The next is the myeloid tube. Here also, most of the red dots are negative for most of the myeloid markers. When we go to the T tube, the, all the red dots are positive for CD3 and CD7. So we are dealing with some kind of T cell neoplasm. And they are 4 and 8 negative. So these red dots are 4 and 8 double negative T cells. These are the normal T helper cells. These are the normal T CD8 positive T cells. And these are the cells, red dots, which express CD3 and 7, but they are negative for 4 and 8. So we have a new plasm, which is double negative T cells expressing surface CD3. 45 strong. So any guesses? We did the cytoplasmic tube. Obviously, CD3 has to be positive. Surface CD3 was positive. Obviously, cytoplasmic CD3 will be positive. The rest NTMPO is negative. The rest of the B markers were negative. So the blast, blast strongly expressed 45, also expressed 3 and 7. For negative for 4 and 8, 5 was negative or weak. And we did TCR gamma delta. It was nicely positive. CD1A negative. TDT was negative, 5 was weakly positive or negative, 1A is negative, 7 strongly positive. So to conclude, the BLAST expressed strong 45, surface CD3, CD7, TCR gamma delta, and weak 5, and had a patient had a big spleen on the liver. So this was a case of hepatosplenic gamma delta T cell lymphoma, which is commonly seen in, again, in teenagers and very commonly confused with T cell ALLs, isochrome 7, you need to do cytogenetic studies, and one must be very careful when you're dealing with T cell ALLs because they resemble T cell ALL and they have a very classical pattern on the bone marrow biopsies. They come with pancytopenia and hypercellular bone marrow biopsies. And if you are not careful, if you don't do CD3, maybe you might miss out picking up these intracellular spread of tumor cells. Very classically seen in hepatosplenic gamma delta T cell lymphomas. And if you have, if you're lucky to have a liver biopsy in such patient, again, they show you intracellular spread of the tumor cells 
which are double negative T cells. Now there are two cases. If you see on the left side is T cell ALL, where you see here seven strong, three surface three negative. This is a very classical picture of T cell ALL, which are said surface CD3 negative. They're almost always surface CD3 weak or negative. However, this case is a lymphoma, T cell lymphoma. They are both three and seven surface positive. So one has to be careful. So if to summarize, I just say share with you what are the common T cell proliferations in children which mimic T cell ALL. One is early T precursor ALL. I won't go into details of this. This is again a new entity in the last decade or so has come up. More like a stem cell leukemia has very strong CD34, very very strong CD7, and few myeloid markers. Negative for CD1A, weak CD5. One log. So one you you guys need to read this, but this is another. Entity, new entity, which has been in the last five, six years very popular. Second, as I mentioned, hepatosplenic gamma delta T cell lymphoma. Third is a benign entity called as autoimmune lymphoproliferation syndrome. Now, in my practice, we get to see a kid in three or four months who has ALPS and com comes to us. Actually, he won't come to Tata, my, my cancer hospital, but such kids go to a benign pediatric hospital with non specific complaints of cough or boils or some skin infection. And when you do peripheral blood, they might have lymphocytosis. If you do peripheral blood immunophenotyping, you'll have large, more than 90, 95% double negative T cells. However, the criteria of ALPS is more than 2% of double negative T cells, which are alpha, beta, is abnormal. So this is another not uncommon entity. And many times we get lymph nodes of ALPS, which again look very bad. Mitotically active. Can be missed, can be confused with blastic lymphoma. One has to be careful. Now I go to the case five, which is, I think, my uh, last case of the day. Uh, this is a young male uh, with biceratopenia. Periphysmia revealed 90% blast. MPO was negative. And if you look at this blast, there are blasts, and one blast has some kind of odd rod, not sure, but this was the only one. And there are dyspoietic myeloid cells, myelocytes, some blasts here, three, four blasts, five blasts. So we called it uh, MPO weakly positive acute leukemia. It was weakly positive MPO, cytochemical. So we did flow here. We did all the five tubes. And if you look at this, first is a B tube. And you look at this uh, here, this uh, dot plot, 34 and 19 here. Look at this, 19 positive. So my 45 week is a big population of 36% cells in progenitor. They're all positive for 34 and they're all positive for 19. So is it a B-cell leukemia? No. The rest of the B-cell markers are negative. As we see, 20 negative. Then we did the myeloid tube. It could still be AML. Then we did the myeloid 10 was negative. Then we did the myeloid tube. All markers for myeloid were positive. 34, 117, 13, HLADR, and CD33. 15 and 117 also positive. So we are dealing with a myeloid neoplasm, which has an aberrant expression of CD19. Here, CD56 is positive in the T-tube. So all the T markers are negative in the red dots. You have to believe me, the red dots are the blast, and they are positive for CD56. So here, we have two interesting markers. And in the cytoplasmic tube, NTMP was weakly positive, though. The so NTMP on the flow can be tricky. So our final diagnosis in this young boy was AML with CD19 and 56 positivity, and translocation A21. Trade 3 NPM SEP power negative. Patient was given chemotherapy and we called him back after 30 days. For remission status, bone marrow morphology was done. On microscopy, it remained blast. You can see this four cells, one to three. They are blasts. Looks like a blast. Some myelocytes, myelocytes, atypical cells, maybe blasts, but surely these three are blasts. So bone marrow morphology revealed 22% blasts. Microscopy we reported, not in remission, and they got the flow report. We get the flow report same time, so we report together. But morphological provisional opinion was not in remission. Now the flow came to us, and it showed something interesting. We have CD34 here, 45 week in the progenitor area. There are almost 22% blasts, which are 34 positive, 45 week. So they are blast, 22%, 34 positive by flow. But they all come in the normal templates pattern. If you look at CD11734 and HLADR117, 38, 34, 
These are very normal patterns of myeloblast. So what are we dealing with? Are the cancer cells or the normal myeloblast? There are some stem cells here, 34 positive, 38 negative. If you look at the 19 and 56, they are lost. They are not present. So the blast on remission do not express CD19 and CD56. The blasts, they all lie within the normal templates. They don't go out. So there is no LAIP. They are not away from normals. So are these normal blasts? It was difficult for me to call it normal blast. This came to me last year. It was very tricky. I have three more colleagues with me, Nikhil, Prashant, and Mani. All of them, they thought it's in remission. I had an issue because I've been reporting all my life of more than 5%, 8% blast, not in remission. Now, this case shows you 20% blast, and all of them 34 positive. But no LAIP, no, LIP, no LAIP, leukemia associated immunophenotype, and no out of normals, now away from normals. So are these normal myeloblasts? What I did, I called my medical oncologist. I asked my colleague, Manju Sengar, what do you think? To me, it doesn't look in remission, but my colleagues think it's in remission. She tells me, uh, Dr. Gujral, the patient looks fine. His counts are coming well. To me, it's, he, he's in remission. Even if you say 22% blast, to me, it looks fine. So I requested her, can you repeat a bone marrow after 10 days? Because we have never seen a case like this 22 percent blast so we repeated the bone marrow and we again studied the morphology and mrd now look at the smears hardly any blast maybe one percent or two percent blast no blast and we did the flow same patterns the progenitor has very few cells now three percent cells which might have hematogones and some blast myeloblast normal myeloblast and we did the markers some basophils some dendritic cells plasma satellite dendritic cells and these are the normal myeloblasts. Normal myeloblasts, patterns of HLADR 34, 19 negative, 56 negative. So basically to conclude, the first bone marrow post-induction was in remission and second one is also in remission. However, in the first we had 22% blasts, but these were normal myeloblasts. So if you see this picture, which has all three cases, this is the upfront picture when patient came to us new, a lot of blasts, blast express 34, blast express 19 and 56. However, during the first in post induction, 19 is negative, 56 is negative. This is 19 negative, 56 negative. Second time also 19 negative, 56 negative. Blasts are within the normal template. So first MRD was negative, second MRD was negative. So basically, as we confuse the B-cell ALL with hematogone, similarly, AML myeloblast may be confused with normal myeloblast. So that's important take-home message in this case, which all my life maybe we've been, I've, I've been doing hematopath for the last 25 years. We've been calling you know, more than 5% blast, not in remission. So the point is, if you have more than 5% blast, please, please, please do flow. You must do flow. There could be normal myeloblast. If the blasts are less, you may not do flow. But if the blasts are more than 5%, if you're calling it on morphology, please do flow. And look at the patterns, look at LAIPs. So this is my last slide. Uh, friends, uh, you do flow, you do uh, MRD, whatever you do, but you need to have a good quality control in your lab. It's both obviously internal control as well as external quality control. Participation in a PT program is mandatory. The accreditation has taken over in India in the last decade very, very aggressively. So uh, I'm sure in West, most of the labs are accredited. You cannot have a lab, but in India, there's no mandatory. The labs need not be accredited. But if you are doing MRD, if you're doing high, high and flow, it's very important to have trained staff, you know, adequate reagents, maintenance of instruments, good technological support, and your processes in order. Uh, this is the slide to show my colleagues in my lab. Uh, Shaila is, is our senior technician. And Mani is the officer in charge. His name is Subramanian. He's officer in charge of the hematopath lab. Nikhil uh, is a colleague. He's keen in molecular hemat. He's in Seattle working with Jay Shandure and Brent right now for one year sabbatical. Uh, Prashant is our, as I told you, rock star in flow. He does, he's a, he's a magic man. And then we have Badri, um, Ashok, Badri, Sitaram. Nikhil is our SR, is right now fellow. And now this is my adult 
team of hematolymphoid where we have clinicians. Hari left us, Manju is here, Tanuja, my colleagues. And this is the adult pediatric hematolymphoid. Banavli is the chief of pediatric and adult hematolymphoid groups. And now this is, this is our lab. We have beautiful residents. And uh, we are, you're all welcome to come to Bombay, India sometime. And uh, visit us if you visit Mumbai. We'll be very happy to show you around. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I'm very happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mujra. So it was a very good lecture for us. Thanks a lot. Um, if you guys have any questions. Dr. Mujra, my name is Clara. I wanted to ask you a question about the last case. Um, I just wanted to know if the marker positive for CNH nineteen was present. Uh, is that enough to consider the phenotype, or do we need more B cell markers? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat your question, please? Sure. I'm sorry. The last case you mentioned that uh, it's an AML with CD19 positivity. Is that enough for us to consider a mixed phenotype, or do we need more B cell markers for that? No, we need more B cell markers. Uh, for mixed phenotypic, yeah, I mean, CD19 need to be very strong. Uh, otherwise, you need to do cytoplasmic 79 alpha and 22. So mixed MPL is a little tricky entity, and especially, you know, 19 is a, unless until it's very, very strong. And this case, 10 was negative. Yeah. And 19, 79 alpha and cytoplasmic 22 were negative. So we didn't call it mixed. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mindral. Thanks a lot. Thank you.